grab one of those. We're going to try to record it this time. Although, you know, Bible class on recording is not the same as Bible class in person. Mm -hmm. Any more than church online is the same as church in person. You all remember that. Mm -hmm. It's not to say, I, I was talking a little bit about this with uh, Ann last night, you know. It's not to say that it doesn't work. I mean, it has its thing. There is a purpose. Like when we were in lockdown or whatever, it had it had a benefit, but it's not the same benefit, right? Right. So, because faith comes by hearing, but there is all the additional, like when you're hearing other Christians together, like when you're watching the stream, all you hear is me, basically. Yeah. So that's no good. Um, well, I shouldn't say it's no good. <laughs> it's not that great. Speaking of being no good, Pastor. Um, yeah, you heard the sermon. The uh, it, it's one of the more challenging topics that we have to actually like talk about the office of the holy ministry. But then, but pastors are the ones who primarily teach about their job or their vocation. So it sounds a little self-justifying, doesn't it? Like pastors talking about like, you need to make sure you pay me. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, well, yeah, right. It'd be better if it came from somebody like the people trusted and who was like respectable, like somebody like Don. Right. Right. Well, I mean, you are a congregation president, so, yeah. No, and it, and it typically does. It typically does. I mean, a pastor can advocate for himself all he wants. It doesn't make any lick of a difference. But if the congregation leadership says, you know, yeah. So, um, so it is interesting, right? Because you had that, you have this picture. Jesus is actually telling the disciples beforehand that they're going to go out and they're going to they're have this great work of being apostles and they're going to end up naked, thirsty, unclothed, in prison. Uh, what else? Sick. I don't remember. Was it, did I miss something? You know, that's the list of actually what happens to the apostles. This is what happens to them. Just as it happened to Jesus, it happened to them. Which also means that if you want to be a pastor, you have to recognize that may be the life that you live, too. Naked, sick, and in prison. Yeah. So... Uh, God willing, not in my lifetime, because I've got you know family and children here to k take care of, but, but whatever. Um, so I don't know about the sermon today for you, but the, I grew up hearing only one sermon on that text, which is go take care of your neighbor. It was always that. It was always that. And you're like, but it doesn't fit in the context. Like, what's that have to do with the end of the time? Unless it's go take care of your neighbor so that you're saved. And you're like, but that doesn't follow with the rest of the Bible. That's yeah. Saved by work. So... So I tried something different this year. Uh, we'll see how it goes. By the way, not, not something diff different from what I've heard preached, but if you read like anybody before 1950, that's how it was preached. Yeah. So at some point there was a transition, like we need to encourage people to be like, you know, better neighbors. At the end of the church here, it was kind of strange. All right. So anyway, I was going to read you a little bit, but let's not do that. Because, you know, it's a little bit. <laughs> No, I was just, just a page. So you got your hand out, right? In the stead and by the command, speaking of the office of the ministry, I did not plan this, but so it happened. Where's my hand out? Yeah, Luke got me one. Good. I got me one. All right, good. So that worked out perfect. So we've been talking about absolution, and absolution, particularly in the church, is attached uh, to the office of the ministry, to the office of the pastor. Uh, maybe just by way of pre, uh, preview or um, preamble, that's a better word. Um, I'm not really less of a sinner than you are. I don't know if you know that. I just thought maybe it's worth laying that out at the front end. Maybe even more of a sinner. I don't know how you actually measure these things. Is there like a thermometer that you can... All sins are equal before God. Right. But not all are equally sinners before one another. I mean, so I married an axe murderer. Remember that movie? No, you never saw that one. Yeah, there's a movie called So I Married an Axe Murderer. There was a show on Netflix, it was called The Santa Clarita Diet, which was about cannibals. Mm -hmm. And they were acting like normal people, but they were cannibals. Mom was a cannibal. Yeah, no, not all sinners are the same. <laughs> Certainly before God, but not before one another. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that the pastor has been given a job, and it's not actually dependent upon the pastor's character for it to be effective. This is very important, right? So the pastor could be a pretty terrible person, um, in their life, but does that mean that the word that he spoke in Christ's name that was faithful to God's word was not God's word anymore? Does he destroy that? Or the baptism that he administers, the sacrament he hands out? Is it really dependent upon the pastor's character? 
If it's dependent upon the pastor, it's, then it's not dependent upon Jesus' word anymore. At least not entirely, right? Yeah. This is a controversy that the church has dealt with. Uh, it would have been the one of the ecumenical councils, the Donatist controversy. I think it's the third ecumenical council. So like, you know, like 350 AD, a long time ago. You all remember that part of your history, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, there was a question because Rome basically put everybody under the knife and said, you know, held them at knife point, not gun point. They didn't have guns yet. Knife point, right? And said, either you say Caesar is also God or you die. And a lot of the pastors said, mm, Caesar's okay. Yeah, we'll go with Caesar too because they didn't want to die, right? And then after Caesar was out dethroned, then uh, the church is like, uh, what do we do with these pastors? First, first problem, right? Because they rejected the faith. Second problem, what about everything they did? Does that like nullify everything they said and did before? Because they clearly didn't believe, right? And the answer of the church was, no, actually, everything the pastor says and does is dependent upon God's word, not upon him. If it's dependent upon him, then you wouldn't believe any of it anyway. Because that's just another sinner doing sinners. Yeah, thanks. So. What? It's not over Sinner doing sinner things? Yeah. yeah, it is redundant. That's correct. All right, good. So let's look at the handout. Speaking of in the stead and by the command. We are called by the Lord's name because we are baptized in his name. We are called by the Lord's name, or being called by the Lord's name grants us special rights. Ooh, we like the language of rights, don't we? All right, so you got Bibles. You can use your Bibles. Sorry, I got a little bit of a migraine, so if I seem a little weird, it's because I can't see what I'm doing. My eyes are not cooperating with me, nor my head. Yeah, it's okay. This is what happens when I go to auctions. <laughs> I see, yeah, I see spots. <laughs> Why? Yeah, it's a combination of diet, stress, and late night, I guess. I don't know. Here we go. Oh, I know, it's not as big. Can I make it bigger? How do we make it bigger? I usually use my computer, but I decided not to bring it today. Uh, view settings. <gasps> It's as big as it gets. All right. So. I can read it. Yeah. So verse 14 of Second Chronicles 7. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will fear, or I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. All right. So that's a, that's a common kind of uh, grammatical construction, right? What do we call these things? If... Then, right? Uh, I suppose you could even add that, but we're not in this case, right? So if they do what? Call on his name. Repent, right? Turn, seek my face, call on his name, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll forgive them, right? Yeah, I will hear, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Um, this is something that's completely lost in the notion of repentance these days. All right, so I'm trying to use this land. Thing. What? Yeah, that last bit, land. Oh, man. It's like not working. I got this mic and it just doesn't work. I probably should just send it back. All right. It's all, you, you all are providing too much interference. <laughs> Sorry. All right. No, it's all right. It's fine. Um, no, the land. Wait a minute. Does the land need healing? Of course. What do you mean? world is corrupt. All right, you mean by the world. That's not what it means by land here. It means, I mean, it's equivalent to nation, right? Your land, your sovereign land, the, your territory, right? We don't have this notion of corporate repentance. I know the last time we had Bible class, which was two weeks ago, was that right? We did talk about, um, you know, why don't politicians um, ever say they're sorry? Because we don't forgive them? Because we won't forgive them. That's correct. We don't forgive. There is no forgiveness for a politician. Or for lawyers and axe murderers. Right. <laughs> no, it's not the job, job of the civil estate to forgive sins. Although they do sometimes. There's pardon, right? Yeah. yeah. But nobody's ever let... Oh, no, actually, president can let somebody completely off the hook. They can. And governors can, too, don't they? Yeah. There is some notion of forgiveness, but it's not... Like, if you've been pardoned, most people still think you're guilty. You just got away with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the same. All right, so it's if-then. Of course, there is a problem with this statement. 
Well, how are you going to repent? How are you going to turn, your, turn around and face God again and call upon him? Can you do that? <laughs> Not by your own reason or strength. That's what we've said all last week. We'll say it again this week. Third article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. Right. Yeah. But the Holy Spirit. So both the act of turning away from sin and the act of being forgiven in Jesus name is all the work of the Holy Spirit. Start to finish. All right. And that comes out especially prominently in the New Testament. But anyway. So but it is an if then statement. I mean, there is like a transaction happening here. Like, I don't go around forgiving people who aren't repentant. Like, what? I, they say, I didn't sin. Well, then you don't need forgiveness. Well, but I feel guilty. Well, then you did sin. <laughs> well, what, is it that, what sin did you commit that you, need, that you feel guilty about? Oh, oh, I see how that works. Yeah. All right. So uh, the proclamation of forgiveness of sins always goes with the proclamation of sin. <laughs> Otherwise, what are you forgiving? All right. So there's always an if-then like that. All right, Acts chapter what? 10, 10 verse 43. 43. I'm typing on a, piece, on a piece of glass. All right. Oh, yeah. We want a little context, maybe? I could do it right here. This is uh, St. Peter preaching, right? And he commanded us to preach to the people. This is just Peter. Here is Peter telling everybody what his job is as pastor. So I guess it's nothing new to have to justify your own job description. Right? He commanded us to preach to the people to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. And here's the key. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. All right? So, what's the question? What else is granted to us through Jesus' name? Yeah, remission of sin. Whoever believes in his name We've talked a lot about his name. We talked at the beginning, right, of this class, we were talking about how we start the service, the name given to us in baptism. That's the name we believe in, Jesus. All right. Yeah. All right. So the Lord promises that those who are called by his name will be forgiven if they humble themselves and confess their sins. Right? Or I, would, I would just change that language. I would just say, if they are humbled. I think it's the Lord who does the repenting. That's how you see it in the Bible. It's like the people don't really repent. The Lord brings them to repentance, sometimes quite painfully, right? Yeah. Just after calling upon the name of the Lord and confessing our sins, we receive forgiveness. The minister forgives our sins. This event, ooh, that's interesting, is called holy absolution. The minister gives us absolution. I suppose we should say what that word means. You know what that word means? It's a $10 church word. Anybody? Try to break it down. Doing some grammar here. Get this. All right, it's got a prefix. The prefix is. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you see? Salute. Salute. Right. Salute. And then. Yeah. All right. So this is. It just means to apply liquid solution. Right. So what is applied in absolution? Baptism. Yeah, that's correct. The water of your baptism. The blood of Jesus could do either. One and the same. Yeah, you ever thought about that? Yeah, okay, good. We learned something today. If we learn one thing, I figure that's a success, right? All right, but it is not really the minister who gives absolution. The minister uh, says that he forgives our sins in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus. Today we learn, we will learn what in the stead and by the command means, all right? I think we've hinted at this quite a bit already, but it's worth doing. The Bible teaches that only God can forgive sins, right? Remember they asked that the uh, Pharisees asked Jesus, you know, and Jesus agrees with them. Yeah, it's true. Only God can forgive sins. Yeah. So then it begs the question, right? I, I don't know if I use that expression right, but I don't really care. That's how we use it today, right? There is a question that's well, then how can the pastor does it? Or even more so, or even additionally, how is it that the Lord gives us authority in the Lord's Prayer to forgive one another? If only God can forgive. All right, so we're going to try God to... God can forgive, and he... It was a rhetorical question. I didn't expect to... <laughs> 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 Nothing wrong with that. We're not supposed to answer yet. We're going to look. 
didn't say it was rhetorical. <laughs> no, it's all good. Say it again, Gabe. It's fine. Go. Since God can only forgive sins, and he has the power over everything, he can give us the power to forgive sins. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Problem solved. Problem solved. Well done. The question then is, has he? So let's, that's what we're going to look at. All right. The Bible teaches that only God can forgive sins. Read the following psalm together. All right. So say it with me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Oh, that's kind of what I wish the daily prayer sounded like, but I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm just talking at the screen. So, um, Yeah, so who is it that forgives sins? The Lord, right? Yeah, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Anybody else? If he forgives all iniquities, then who else forgives iniquities? No, that's it. It's God, right, through Jesus. Yeah. Hey, he forgives them all. You don't need anybody else's forgiveness. You've got it all from God. All right. So we sin against God. Therefore, only God can forgive sins. That's important to note, too. We do sin against one another. But in sinning against one another, we also then sin against, sin against God. God, right? God says, honor your father and your mother. So if you sin against your parents, who are you sinning against? God, right. God says... Honor your marriage, right? Do not commit adultery. So if you sin against your spouse, who are you sinning against? God, right. All right, good. So how then can a minister, if only God forgives sins, how can the minister forgive sins? That is a rhetorical question again, Gabe, so don't answer. (laughs) We're going to actually look at a store Bible text. All right, Matthew chapter 9. If you've got your own Bible, you can follow along. Maybe your words are a little different. I don't know. Maybe I can make it fill the width. Let's see if I can do that. View settings. No, nope, that's gonna do vertical. Uh, I don't want. I don't want the margin. Oh well. So it is. At least it's clear. All right. Put that. So who wants to read? Who might want to read? One through nine, or one through eight, I should say. Your eyes are not gonna work. Okay. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on the bed. And Jesus, seeing that they had set up to the sick of the palsy, Son of God, or Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Mm-hmm. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether, for whether it is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. And when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto him. Very nice. Got like the old language, right? So, um, what were we saying? Oh, yes, questions, right? This is a story we hear every year. It's in the lectionary. Not from Mark, though, or Matthew, I should say. Is it from Matthew? I don't think it's from Matthew. I think we hear it from Luke, maybe. You see the picture. The picture has him being let down from the roof, but in the, this version, you don't hear that, right? They just brought him on the bed. But in the other, the house is full. That's Luke, I think, right? All right, same story, though. So the question is, what did the scribes say that Jesus was doing when he forgave man, the man? Blaspheming. So, yeah, blaspheming. We don't use that word very much because we like to just look the other way when people blaspheme. I don't know how your friends or neighbors or family would respond if you said that's blasphemy. They'd probably say, what happened to you? That's a weird, weird word to say, right? But what is blasphemy? Making oneself God. Making oneself God, that's what, all right. Anybody else? It is kind of fun to say, 
It is fun to say, right? I mean, it, it is a, it's a transliteration. You can, I don't know if you can read Greek. And it's very, very small. Blasphemos. Blasphemos, right? So it's just a Greek word. Um, what does it say there? To drop evil or profane words. Yeah, to speak lightly or amiss of sacred things. So it's to misuse the holy things. Yeah, interesting, right? Yeah, it can mean to slander or speak ill or prejudice of one. Uh, and then the third meaning there is to speak impiously or irreverently of God. So maybe it has a little bit of both the first and the last meaning, right? Yeah, so to, to speak ill of the sacred things. So, I mean, to forgive sins is a holy thing because it comes only from God. Yeah. Good question. What's the difference between um, like the definition of heresy and blasphemy? Mm, yeah, I mean heresy is specifically connected to uh, false doctrine, okay. false teaching. Okay. This is I, I like that from uh, who was the who did they get that definition from? Some old guy, uh, a sick whoever this guy is, a sickness or something. Whoever I don't know. It's abbreviated as if I'm supposed to know who that is. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the distinction between teaching falsely and then mishandling the, the things of God. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in a sense, they're related because yeah. you can mishandle the word of God. Right. Yeah. So, um, but heresy is a sp- specifically false just teaching. false teaching. Right. Yeah. So blasphemy starts with false teaching, or be- it leads into false teaching. First, you mishandle God's word and then it, and then it becomes the whole heretical doctrine. Yeah. Good question. All right. So who... They were saying he's blaspheming. How did Jesus prove that he had authority to forgive sins? <laughs> this is an interesting question. By healing the man. Yeah, by healing the man. Now, how does that work? Yeah, so you know I have authority to do this. Then he said to the man, rise, take up your bed and walk. Like I said, you hear this every year. So hopefully you've heard a sermon on this already. Problem is, even though you could hear it every year, that would require you to be in church every Sunday of every year. <laughs> yes, okay. All right, what do you think? I know that's a hard question. Who's he saying he is by giving the man healing? God. That's right, right. The one who made the heavens and the earth and gave life is the only one who can restore life, right? Yeah, so he, he yes, I am God. Don't believe me? Here we go. All right, follow along. In the space below, you don't have pens. Write exactly what the multitudes magnified and gloried, glorified God about, or what God had given men the power to do when they it saw sense. it. Right, yeah, what is it? Yeah, it's not the healing. I think it's the power to forgive sins. That would be my guess. I mean, the healing's part of that, too, I suppose. Right, but he'd given power to men to forgive sins. The disciples had a hard time with this, too. No, this because that is the good news. That's the gospel, and yet, not until the gift of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost do they really do it. They just don't. They go about doing the same thing we expect churches to do today: is to tell us how to live a better life. Now, and, uh, it doesn't go so well. <coughs> like casting out demons. That's nice, right? It's helpful, right? But it doesn't save eternally. Right? Um, yeah, so did God give this power to one man or to men? Ooh, singular, plural. Answer? Plural. Plural. Yeah, and, and then we've talked about this word a lot. I highlighted it for you. I don't know if you can read Greek, but it's... Oh, they transliterated it there. Exousia. Anybody remember that word? All right. So you've got... You've got exousia, right? Uh, exousia. And then you've got another one that you know. I don't remember how to spell this. Uh, Dunamis. All right. Yeah. Duna, no, there's not. Mis. There we go. Anyway, exousia, we usually, I prefer to translate as authority. This is very important to our conversation today. Dunamis, you can kind of guess what that sound, what's that would sound like in English. Dunamis. Dunamis. <laughs> That's a different word. <laughs> how about if I said it, dynamis? Boom! Dynamite. Dynamite. Yeah, yeah it's, the, it's the root for dynamite. Power. Right. Like dy- dynamic is something that's powerful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not this word. It's not the power word. It's the authority word. Like somebody who's been placed into something else. 
which is really important because why did they translate it as power when it's authority. the authority to do a thing? So it's not just pure power, you know, like uh, like the cultural Marxists want to think everything's Maybe about, it's about pure power. Power is easier to spell than authority. It is power, but it's power exercised under authority, right? Responsibly, right? According to your office, right? So, for example, what did the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals say about the OH? The, the OSHA um, ruling. Anybody know? Yeah, they overturned it. They overturned it because they didn't have the authority to exercise that power. There's no grave threat. It didn't, it didn't distinguish between different kinds of people. Some people are more at risk than others, and it didn't make any distinction. Um, and never mind, Congress had never authorized them to make such a ruling. Only under the most loosest interpretation could you possibly say. It's what the Fifth Circuit said. It'll go to the Supreme Court eventually. Right. After everybody's lost their job, that you know, is under this. My my cousin law. She worked for health, in healthcare. She lost her job on Friday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you know. that's partly because the healthcare industry got widely consolidated under Obamacare, which you know miraculously made everything cheaper. Remember? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. But what we ended up not having. You don't have family doctors. You don't have small clinics. You have all these like massive healthcare systems, right? Which means they can impose massive things and it's really hard to sue them because they're in multiple states. So Oklahoma repealed it, but she's in Indiana. So same, same hospital system in Indiana that can keep going even though Oklahoma AG got a, got a um, what do you call it? State? A state, no, it was an emergency injunction. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so the word here is power, but it is power under authority, right? So that's important. Yes, forgiveness is a powerful thing. It is absolutely powerful. It changes hearts and minds and really your whole being but it, it's exercised under the authority of God. God gives the authority to forgive. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. all right, good. Then, in the story, oh, I was probably gonna say it all, what I just said right here on the sheet. I didn't read ahead. As we learned only God can forgive sins, the scribe said that Jesus was blaspheming when he forgave sins, misusing God's word. Uh, oh, there it is. Blasphemy is a mere, when a mere man claims to be God or mocks God by pretending to be God. Jesus was a man. He was not supposed to forgive sins. That's not the whole story, though. (laughs) He's not just any man. Jesus is God. All right, you know all this. Um, This, I'm going to skip to the next paragraph. That means that it is no longer impossible for a man to forgive sins, right? So what Jesus brings to mankind, it's, um, he actually restores our humanity by forgiving us. Then now we live in the life that he has. Which is an interesting note when you want to talk about the ministry. The apostles can do the same sort of things that Jesus did. Like heal the sick, raise the dead, even. Like, how is that possible? Because the same thing that, the same authority Jesus had, he conferred on them. Uh, Then it gets interesting because it really only lasts through that one generation. And then their successors are very much limited to preaching, teaching, baptizing, sacrament, altar, forgiveness. Yeah. That's another conversation for another time. All right. Read Matthew 10. Ooh, I cited that in the sermon today. I wonder if that's a coincidence. (laughs) Maybe, maybe not. I cited the end of the chapter, but that's okay. I talked about it. This is the beginning of that chapter. Remember the part about, like, if they don't receive you, it's worse for them than Sodom and Gomorrah? That's the consequences. This is actually what he sends them to do, which is the positive aspect. (laughs) That was the more negative. All right, one through four. Go for it. And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, the son of Elpheus and Lebeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas, Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Imagine, I mean, you're only like a third of the way in the book, and it's like, yeah, by the way, the tax collector guy. Oh, yeah, the one who's going to betray him. (laughs) Those poor guys. It's kind of like Thomas, right? Nobody just calls him Thomas. It's like, why not? You should call him the twin, Didymus. That's his other name. No, what do they call him? Doubting. It's like, 
Your reputation precedes you. <laughs> the, the order of the apostles is pretty, pretty consistent. I don't know if you've ever noticed that too. It's almost always in the same order, or very similar to the same order. And James comes before John, which is interesting, since John wrote more than James did. Right? But of course, Simon, who's called Peter, is the beginning. You got the idea. So there is an, there is an ordering of things amongst the apostles. Um, you know, God doesn't just say, or Jesus does, doesn't send them and say, you guys just go figure it out. He actually, he orders them. You can see the picture up there, right? They're, they're kind of, I don't know what they're each doing. I think we need to dust it too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right, which men are given the power of Jesus? That's an easy question. All men. Yeah, it's actually the 12. You notice that? Even Judas, right? But he misuses it, he abuses it or neglects it or actually just forsakes it really. Yeah, but it's, it's actually not all. I mean, he gave it he gave it to his 12 disciples. That's what we're talking about today. I mean, again, we have to, I have to say, I have to correct, I almost provide a corrective all whenever we talk about this topic because it's like, I'm not better than you, I'm not more important than you, but I have been given a particular office that's different than yours, right? I'm a preacher of the word, you're a hearer of the word, right? I'd like to have, I'd like there to be more preachers of the word and hearers of the word, so... You know, if you're so inspired, go to seminary. Mm, mm, mm. You know, uh, but recognize you're going to be naked and unclothed and hungry for a lot most of the time, and except for if you happen to be blessed with a very generous congregation, that so you can actually live a respectable life. All right, so moving along. Oh, we should ask the question: power. Which power word? What do you want to guess? Yeah, it's not just raw power. This, yeah, this is why you have to be careful with translations because, especially now in our context, everything is about who's in control, right? Who has the power? Which party is in power? They even use that language, which is the wrong language. It's which one has the authority, which is also why, like, elections, you know, need to be done with integrity so that the authority is clearly conferred. If there's question about that, then you, then you question the authority. Then you also end up questioning whether they have the power to do the things they're doing. Right? Yeah. So this is always true with authority. Authority matters. Very important. Otherwise, the things that they do may be illegitimate. Right? Same thing with pastor. You have to ask, does pastor have that authority? If he doesn't, then we don't have to necessarily listen to him. Or if Don's doing what he's... Does Don have the authority to say, has that been given to him, right, congregation president? Or not? That's really relevant. It's a very important question. All right, so there you go. Again, poor translation, my opinion, but I'm not going to argue with the translators because, you know, this is kind of my beef. I did, it's not mine alone. I received it from others, but you go. All right, the end of Matthew's gospel. Very important statement. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority. Why authority here? When it was powered before. Why? Okay, anyway. It's the same word, it's exousia. Has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, imperative, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. That's a uh, subordinate clause. We'll talk about that in a second. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Also subordinate clause. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right? So... You, you know this really well, right? It's called the, what do we call this usually? The Great Commission. The Great Commission. Who is it given to? The Twelve. The Twelve. To the Apostolic Office. Except in the Missouri Synod, it's usually said, everybody's supposed to go and make disciples by baptizing and teaching. You're like, well, wait a minute. When I go to church, I don't baptize and teach. The pastor does. <laughs> like, there's a conflict here. Right. All right, I said subordinate clause. Um, now, the authority, I mean, we could diagram this, but anybody remember doing sentence diagramming? I hated it. <laughs> right, I hated it until I had to try to read in Greek. <laughs> then I'm like, oh, or German. And I'm like, oh, I do need to be able to understand clauses. And, okay. When you're native, whatever your native language is, you just kind of inherently understand, but yeah, it's different. All right, so all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me is connected to I am with you always until the end of the age. All right. How is Jesus with them until the end of the age? Through the baptizing and teaching? Through the authority he's been given. 
right? They bear his authority, and so they, uh, he is with them, right? This is very important. I come and say, in the stead and by the command. I'm not Jesus, but in effect, you're hearing and receiving Jesus just by way of me as an instrument, you know? I'm like a, uh, I don't know what you want to call me, a sound, a clanging gong or a noisy cymbal, but <laughs> no one calls it. Not, not, a, not a beautiful trumpet. Okay. Uh, and then notice here, I said subordinate clause. Go, imperative, therefore, and, but therefore is a really important word even in English, right? Because you have authority, you can go. With that authority, you must go, <laughs> right? And make disciples of all nations. And then here's the thing. How? Subordinate clause. By baptizing them and by teaching them. Those two things go together. This is a, uh, if, you have, well, if you have any experience in, in Christian congregations, uh, it, like my whole lifetime, it's just like, it's much like confirmation. People treat baptism like, well, they're baptized, so they're saved. They're like, well, you, you forgot about the second half. Teaching them to observe all things I command you. How do, how, does, how do they remain in their baptism? Through the teaching of Jesus' word and the forgiveness of sins that they hear in their ears. Right? So you can be baptized, but then reject your baptism by rejecting Jesus' word. That's Mark 16, verse 16, which is in the Catechism, if you don't believe me. I'm looking at Leah, Leah believes me. She's in Catechism instruction right now. Yeah. You know, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will also reject their baptism, if they have it, and not be saved. Okay. Be condemned. All right. Got it? All right. So that's a fun text. How long will this power be given to these men? Until... Yeah, until all the saints of heaven are numbered, until all those who would believe have been counted, right? So do we know when that is? No. Does Jesus know when that is? No. no. Only the Father. Only the Father. Which is kind of a crazy thought, isn't it? No. All right. See, now we're doing on time. Good. The twelve apostles were given Jesus' power, and this power continues to the end of the age, but all the disciples died. Dun, 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 dun. How can they have Jesus' power to the end of the age if they're not really alive anymore? All right. To the apostolic office, right? F1, holy Christian, and? Apostolic. apostolic church. Before the apostles died, they ordained men to carry on the power of Jesus. Right? So this is authority conferred, handed down from generation to generation, right? Uh, much like uh, households used to be, right? The father to the son, usually the eldest son, right? Eldest son. If you had a family business... That's a pretty good example, right? Yeah, you laugh. Was that a joke? Well, no, because her son doesn't want to take He doesn't want to hang <laughs> This is interesting. You really, we talked about this when we were talking about Naboth in the vineyard in the daily prayer, right? And that, that they, they held that, like, if they received an inheritance, that was a gift from God, and you did not forsake it, mm-hmm. and you preserved it. It's a little interesting. Yeah. So you must maintain the coffee business, which I established. <laughs> Take it over and let it grow and flourish. Yes, you have to. He doesn't want to, there's a few other options. Well, that's true. You could take over the recording. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Pick you, some. You have other options with the other kids. Well, we were ta- I was talking about this with a pastor because unfortunate tendency in the Missouri Synod, with the exception of the Hubners, <laughs> which you see at the top row, um, is that we don't really do that kind of inheritance idea with congregations. The pastors don't train up pastors to continue the work that they've begun. In the way that Paul did, I mentioned that in a sermon, Titus and Timothy were both trained by pastor, by Pastor Paul. <laughs> pastor Paul moved on, and then Pastor Timothy or Pastor Titus continued that work, and then they assuredly did the same. They raised up pastors there to follow them. And Because you can imagine what happens after each pastor, because they usually leave with some kind of trauma. <laughs> Sorry, it happens. And if that's a little too close to home. But... Um, then you like lose whatever momentum you had gained. And the next pastor comes along and said, we're just going to undo everything and just move on. It was the most astounding thing that happened um, when I served the vacancy in Chicago because I came in the first day and I just, I, I started, I did the thing, you know, I did the service. And, there were, and the first day people were like, that was just like Pastor Hines who was there before me. I'm like, well, yeah, of course it was. And they're like, what? You're a different person. I'm like, yeah, but... The elders and, you know, those who they interviewed the various possibilities and they said, we want a pastor who is not, we're not going to lose that momentum. We've, we've spent a lot of time and effort 
in building up the life of the congregation in a particular kind of character and fashion, you know, local, but still. And we don't want that to... I said, I watched the video of his... I watched a couple of videos of his service so that I was prepared to just do the things like he did it. I didn't... There's no reason. Why would you want to overturn everything that came before? I don't know that pastor who's supposed to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's now my uh, sister-in-law and their nieces and nephews, their pastor in Indiana. It's kind of funny. All right, anyway, what are we talking about? I got lost. Um, Oh, yes, here we go. St. Paul, for example, I said all this, ordained Timothy as pastor at his church. He taught Timothy everything that he had been taught, and then he laid hands on him, ordaining him, right? Then Timothy did the same when he got older, and so did that person, and so on, and so on, and so forth, ad nauseum, right? For the last 2,000 years, this office has passed on from the apostles to ministers, from one minister to the next through the church. This is how Jesus' power to forgive sins is passed on to ministers today. Uh, Although we ended up with a very interesting question in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. When uh, they came across, the Saxon immigrants came across and landed in Perry County, Missouri, and they had a bishop who had been ordained by a bishop in Germany and who had been ordained by a bishop bishop before him, et cetera, et cetera. And so then that bishop came over. He was going to train up and raise up pastors here in the U.S., having confirmed that authority. They had a long chain of command that they could trace a long way back, they believed to St. Peter even, um, because remember, everybody that started the Reformation had been Roman Catholic priests and had received ordination through the priesthood. Okay. Um, and so, but then that, the, the bishop, his name was Martin Stephan, he, um, uh, he had multiple young women come up and accuse him of marital infidelity. He had left his wife and kids behind in Germany, which is like, and then you get on a boat for a few months. It doesn't seem like a very smart move in my book. So then there's questions. His family to this day defends his honor and says that, it, that it's not. It, Missouri Synod drummed up the, the whole conspiracy in order to just run him out. Which is completely possible. This is before the Synod, but the Saxon immigrants. So CFW Walter, first founder, president, Missouri Synod, right? President of St. Louis Seminary, pastor of four congregations, also then writes about communism, we talked about, right? Um, CFW Walther had to search the scriptures and say, well, what do we do? Do we have to send men back over to Germany to get ordained there, and then they can come back and serve here? And Walther's answer was actually no. If they uh, preach and teach according to the, what the scriptures have given it, within the apostolic tradition, in other words, teach, preach and teach what they've been, what's been handed over, even if they haven't received a laying on of hands specifically from somebody in that we, Walter could self-appoint pastors. And so we actually, Missouri Synod, we started over. We have no succession. All of our pastors have been, really start with CFW Walter, with the exception of the ones that were in Fort Wayne, Indiana area, and the ones um, in mid-Michigan, who were ordained in Germany and then came over. But all those coming out of the Saxon, because we have, you know, this Missouri Synod, there's the Saxons, the Hanoverians, and the Franconians different German group. They didn't really get along, but they, uh, I don't know, this congregation, I keep asking, Ron's not here, but Ron will tell me where people are from in Germany. Anyway, those are the three main people groups. Um, and they, but the Saxons, they did not, they could not trace their ordination back past the landing in Perry County, Missouri, because Walter broke that chain of, chain of authority. Just an interesting side note. That's just a tradition. That's, that was ultimately where Walter came down. It's like, do they preach and teach according to God's word? Fine. Are they been examined by other pastors as being sound and teaching and preaching? Yes. Then they can be ordained by the church. All right. Um, so in the stead, in the absolution, the pastor says that he forgives in the stead. I love all these old words, don't you? Yeah. Thank you, Bobby, for reading from the uh, old version, too. What does this mean? Oh, there's a Lutheran question. Vasistas. We say instead, in such a sentence as mom went to the store instead of dad. Actually, it would usually be dad never goes to the store, mom only does it. (laughs) This means that dad was going to go to the store, but mom went in his place. Got it? What? I said every time. Every time. That's right. Actually, if I went to the store, it would be in mom's place. She's the homemaker. That's her vocation, so... I would be taking her place, but regardless. In absolution, it's the same thing. Jesus forgives us, but the minister stands in his place. You see the picture, right? Yeah, for the sign. 
The words of the minister are not his words, but Jesus's words. How can the minister be speaking to us? But yet, this is Jesus speaking to us. Uh, this is a, min- a mystery. I don't think it's such a mystery. There was a guy in the, in the Gospels that didn't think it was a mystery at all. Right? It was a centurion. He said, come heal my servant. Came to Jesus. Right? We have this text every year too. Come heal my servant. And uh, Jesus is like, okay, I'll come down with you. And he's like, no, no, you don't have to come down with me. He's like, what? He's like, no, I say to my people, go and do this thing. And they do it and go to there and they go there. All it, just speak the word only and my servant will be healed. So he, all he, he says is it's the word that has the authority. It doesn't even require you, Jesus, in the person to be in that place. The word, speaking that word to the centurion, and then he goes back home with that word from Jesus, will bring the healing of Jesus. So in a way, oh, I never thought of this until today. Look at this. The centurion becomes an apostle with Jesus' word. Right? Because Jesus says, your servant... Okay, go, your servant is healed. And then as he's going home, the, somebody else comes out to meet him and said, at that very hour, his servant had been healed. Right? He didn't even get to his servant before the word actually had its, its way. Jesus is not limited by this kind of like... Ta, 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 ta. So then the question is, if Jesus can do that, if he can like broadcast forgiveness across a long distance, right? Um, or heal the man across a long distance in that case, uh, why does he have somebody stand before you in person to say it to you? For the sake of faith? For the, okay. For this, what do you mean? Like, so that you believe it there and then. It's easier to believe it if someone's there telling it to you, to your face. All right. So instead of it being just this idea yeah. that's floating around, there's somebody who says it to you, but it's not just anybody, but it's somebody who you can definitively said Jesus had put there to say those words to you. Mm-hmm. So he says, for the sake of faith, I would say for the sake of confidence, right? Which is faith. But con- we, you could even add that as an adjective. Not just any kind of faith, but confident faith. Right? This is when we talked about uh, private absolution versus the corporate absolution, right? That there are times where, despite hearing it every week, when I stand in the front, say, and stand by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, there's somebody in the pew who doesn't think that word actually applies to them personally. And it does, but they don't believe that. Right? So what, that's where you have that special gift where they could call me and say, Pastor, I heard what you said, but I don't believe... I, they wouldn't say it that way. <laughs> I'm not sure that it applies to this sin that I've committed or this thought that I've had, right? And so then you have that... Then you can actually, I can actually come to them personally, privately, or even sometimes over the phone, which is kind of weird, but I prefer to do it in person because I do all sorts of other things. These are received traditions, but... And then I received a tradition from a brother pastor where it's not just... It's not a light touch, it's a, <laughs> like, this, I'm talking to you right now. <laughs> yeah, eye contact too, by the way, I make eye contact. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's, just, it's just ways of indicating that kind of, it's physical, it's real, it's in person, it's, it's not some kind of just you idea. Your hand, they feel a weight lifted from them. <laughs> I think that's where, it, I think that's the point. Sorry, my screen fell asleep. Is it going to come back? Oh, no. All right, well, we can make it come back. How do we do that? (laughs) Stop mirroring. I have the power. (laughs) Very few of you ever watched He-Man, I'm sure. All right, some of you did. (sighs) By the power of Grayskull. I'm sorry. I'm a Gen X person. You can't. You're just gonna have to deal with it. I'm sure it was once, like ten years ago. Our kids, our kids were in danger. Yeah, it's about ten years. I am not offended by boomers. I just, I just blame them for everything. All right. It's just, a, it's just a cultural thing. It's, it's not personal. All right. Gen, this is Galatians four. Oh, I referred to this in the sermon. Huh, that's funny. Remember I gave you the list of things to go look up? You didn't write them down, did you? No. This is one of them. Uh, I gave you a longer citation, but it's this, this included it. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Yeah, you received me. And he talks about, actually, their support for him. That's why I brought that up in the sermon from, in Galatians 4. Right? They took care of Paul. 
They received him, but notice what they call him. An angel of God. An angel of God, right? So... <laughs> no, angel just means messenger, right? All right. These, these people are too well catechized. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just answer all the questions before you have a chance to think yeah. about it. An angel... Well, we are. <laughs> right. Well, this is. I was talking about this last night with somebody. They were saying, "Oh, you know, it's so nice. Um, your family or the Rathkeys, you know, with all the children, and then, you know, um, and then you, you know, maybe your children will probably have families like that." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's how that works. You you mimic. You either mimic your previous generation or you reject them, right? So I reject the boomers. Um, just joking." <laughs> No, but it's true. It, 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 it does carry forward, but it, either, it has to be done either intentionally. It always has to be done intentionally, either the acceptance or the rejection, right? So yes, we train the younger generation maybe differently than you were trained. Hopefully then the, that carries forward and the next generation after them will continue to receive instruction the way they do. And um, there can be a little bit, you know, not to speak ill of before, but, you know, priorities change over time, right? As far as how we instruct, what we instruct, that kind of thing. All right, anyway, yeah, receive me as an angel of God. Angel is angelos in Greek, and if I just highlight it, it's going to pop up and say... Masculine. Messenger, envoy, one that announces. Right? That's what an angel is. That's what pastor is. I come to you today in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you your sins. It's good news. Of great joy, it shall be for all All people. Yeah, right, to cite something else, but... I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. It's almost Thanksgiving, right? Angels, we have her. Yeah. Too early for Christmas? No, no. not at all. Not at all. It's Speaking of cultural stuff, yeah. Uh, decoration, I should put that up on the board at the end, right? Did, did, you, did Mike talk to you about when we're decorating? Yes. Yes, and what was the verdict? December 4th. December 4th. So not the, not the Saturday after Thanksgiving, the following Saturday. Okay, good to know. So we get, we get one Sunday in Advent, that'll be, and then it will, Christmas. Yeah, okay. I, you know, I was, I, we did it one year where we didn't decorate until like right before Christmas at home. And then it's like, our tree is like, it still died at the same time. It didn't really matter. So it was completely, well, we don't water our trees. Instant fire hazards. Oh, here we go. Second Corinthians. Good. Now then, we are ambassadors. That's a nice word. Ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. In other words, be forgiven. Right? Ambassadors. Sent by God, with God's, by God's authority, with God's authority, pleading to you, imploring you on Christ's behalf, in his stead. Got it? Pretty straightforward, right? Oh, look at that. I should read 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And by might, he doesn't mean maybe. Because he did. Yeah, that we are. So the sheep, the righteous, are those in Christ. That's what it means to be righteous, is to be in Christ, according to the New Testament. All right. Okay, Luke 10. Anybody know? I should have just assigned these and let you read them. 16, not 26? All right. There we go. Oh, yeah. He who hears you, hears me. And he who rejects you, rejects me. Talked about that in the sermon a little bit. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. All right? So that's the difference between the sheep and the goats. Maybe that's a new way for you to hear that, but like I said, that's the majority interpretation for the last 2,000 years. For some reason, the last 50 years, it's about um, doing mercy work for some reason. It's weird. No weird. All right, so that's a simple answer. Um, now, by the way, if the pastor says some absolutely asinine thing, does that mean by not listening to him, you're not listening to Jesus? Just, just to be clear here. No. Uh, I try to make sure I condition things, right? And say, this is just my opinion. Or I'm just speaking, I'm not speaking with God's authority. Even Paul does this. We read that this week in Congregation of Prayer. He's like, Here I'm speaking on the Lord's behalf. Here I'm speaking as an apostle. So he distinguishes his words. This is Jesus' command versus here's kind of like my pastoral advice as an apostle. So there's different levels of authority, right? All right. John 13, verse 20, you see it? 
Up on the screen? Oh, we just read that. No, we didn't. We just read the opposite of that. This oh. is an opposite statement. Look at that. Most assuredly, I say to you, he, receive, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and who receives me receives him who sent me. How's that the opposite? Because in the other one, it was he rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. This oh, one just receives. Oh, look at that. Polar opposites. Yeah, same idea, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, negative and positive, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right, good. And then, of course, Judas betrays him. Speaking of not receiving Jesus. Yeah, that's your prototypical goat right there. Not the greatest of all time. Judas Iscariot? No. All right. I saw I always think about with goat now is Tom Brady. Anyway. <laughs> Away from me. Depart from me, the cursed one. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, here we go. Apostolic authority. All right. And I say to you, also say to you that you are Petros. And on this Petra, if you don't know Greek, there you go. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. That's an important thing to remember. You know, hell, hell can throw anything they want at you. But what does Jesus say? They will not prevail. Right? The victory's already been won. It may seem like they're prevailing. They're not. And I will give you the keys, ooh, okay, of the kingdom of heaven. And you've heard this before because it's in the catechism, office of the keys, right? Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus Christ. All right. So uh, what's important about that? What's the summary? Binding and loosing, right? But notice it's, it's Peter. By the way, um, since we're here, Peter and rock are the same word. There's one's masculine, one's feminine. Right? So the rock is feminine, and Peter is masculine, of course, Petros. Right? And so is Peter the one on whom the church was built? Second yeah, that's what you're saying here. It's on this right before. Who do you say that I am? And there's the Petra, verse 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So that's the statement, that's the rock. Yeah, on this, yes. And look, Peter didn't even get it out of, pull it out of thin air. It says it was revealed to him by the Father who is in heaven, by my Father who is in heaven. Right. So, uh, yes, Peter, God uses Peter and the rest of the apostles to build up his church. But the foundation is not Peter himself, but it's the confession of Peter Jesus on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking stand. All right, I think that's probably pretty good for today. There's more on the back. By the command, right, Jesus commands us to forgive sins. Uh, so that's also important. I mentioned that in the last, well, very end of the sermon. If I fail to forgive you, then you have to hold me to account for that and say, Pastor, I came to you to hear the word of forgiveness. Can you please get to that already? You know? No, I'm serious. I mean, it seems like kind of demanding, but if that's what I've been given to you to do and I'm not doing it, then what's your, what's your response? Just do it. Just do it already, Pastor. I came to hear forgiveness. Stop talking about Tom Brady, right? <laughs> or whatever it is. Make sense? Yep. Okay, yeah. Then how often? One time? Two times? As seven times? As many times as it takes. 70 times seven? Over. Yeah, over and over and over and over and over. Yeah. Good. All right, so you can do the uh, activities and all that on your own. What's that? I'm down. You're ready to go? Oh, yeah, it's going to get dry. It's that time of year. All right, let's close with prayer quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have blessed us uh, with the gifts of your son Jesus, namely his forgiveness, life, and salvation, and have also established um, the office of the ministry by which you deliver those that forgiveness, that purchased in one forgiveness in Jesus um, into our ears uh, to forgive us and to renew us again. Uh, Maintain and uh, preserve that work amongst us today and always. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.